Hello, my name is Eric Hines. I'm curator of film at Museum of the Moving Image. Welcome to this Q&A for Ascension. Uh, welcome if you've just watched the film in our theaters. Uh, also welcome if you're seeing this online. Uh, Ascension is a film that premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival in 2021 um, and has received numerous accolades of the course of the year, um, all well, well deserved and is now shortlisted for the Academy Award for Best Documentary. Um, uh, it is a film that I finally caught up with at the Camden Film Festival in September of last year and immediately became one of my favorites of the year. Um, it is a film, again, that you've just seen, you don't need me to say too much about, um, but it is a film that I've been thinking about ever since um, and have watched since uh, to sort of spend more time with all the decisions made in it. And I can imagine that if you're watching it for the first time, you might want to do the same. Before you do, you get a chance to hear from the filmmakers. So I'd love to introduce, um, coming to us from the West Coast, uh, director Jessica Kingdon and cinematographer and producer, Nathan Truesdell. Hello. Hi, thank you for having us. Wonderful to have you. I've, you've both been to the museum and I'm sorry that I can't have you uh, in person right now, but. Such are the times still, but I'm sure I'll see you very soon. Um, uh, you know, I, I think that uh, this is a film where there's a lot of things to say about it on a minute level. There's also a lot of things to say about it on a kind of larger level. Um, if you don't mind, uh, you know, in terms of those who are just coming at it uh, for the first today, I, I'd love for you to give us a little bit of sense of the journey that you went on in making the film in terms of where it started, uh, what, uh, what you thought of it, you know, what you thought it was going to be in the early stages, and then also maybe what it evolved into? Um, in 2017, I made a short film called Commodity City, which takes place in the largest wholesale mall in the world, which is in Iwu, China. And it's a huge five mile mall where most of the what's considered cheap made in China products come from. It Chances are there are several objects in your room that have passed through the hands of this space. So I was interested in this space because of all of the paradoxes that it embodies, the paradox of the impersonal nature of the industrial supply chain, but also of its intimacy. Intimacy in that most people in the world have a connection to this one space that most of us aren't even aware of that exists. And when I visited it, when I visited, um, I was like, uh, just kind of struck by all of the human moments that were happening all over, families and kids playing on the floor, um, sort of just family life scenes spilling out into the open, even though it's amongst all of these mouse traps and plastic shopping bags and buttons and just every item that you can think of. Um, so from there, I was interested in China, in making films in China, because of that film, for reasons of heritage, I'm half Chinese, I'm Chinese American, and also understanding China as this kind of global stage for um, questions related to the paradox of progress. Mm -hmm. Since China's economic rise, um, after the reform and opening of 1979, the economy's undergone enormous transformations in such a compressed time frame, And so I think a lot of universal questions related to the paradox of progress and the meaning of work are really put under a microscope in contemporary China because of um, such the, the compressed time frame of these changes. So I was trying to understand capitalism and how it functions in a culture different than my own American culture. So that's how um, the journey of Ascension really got started with these questions on my mind. And originally it was supposed to be more um, about a study of um, consumer goods and the life cycle process it goes through. So I was interested in manufacturing and consumerism and then in waste and more, more about pollution. But as we started filming, the thing that seemed to be most compelling and most relevant became this study of upward mobility and kind of a study of materialism. Mm -hmm. um, I, uh, I love Commodity City. It's a, it's a fantastic film, your, your previous short. Is that something that's available online these days or, or yeah. is there a way for folks to see it? Yeah, it's on Vimeo. Okay, I recommend everyone to please see that that film. Uh, and uh, I think it's a, it's a really, uh, it's a really difficult, I, mean, I think ten, it, what you often see in storytelling and reporting um, uh, is uh, maybe favoring 
if, if you're interested in the systems that we're living in, favoring something that is sort of like a look at systems or favoring the kind of um, the minute, the story of the, of the individual living within the system. The thing is so unique about Ascension is I see both of those happening at the same time. There is a systematic portrait um, and structurally it's a systematic portrait. And yet each one of the sort of the, mini, the miniature portraits within it, I feel a real sense of humanity. I feel a sense of individuality. That's a, I think, I mean, just the, the idea of that is if you've seen the film, you see it happen, but at the same time, at least the idea of that seems really, really hard to achieve. Um, so I just loved a little bit about how you sort of went about doing that. Yeah, um, we were just talking about Fred Wiseman and he is someone who is a filmmaker who I really look up to and aspire to that kind of observational style of, of filmmaking where even though in his films he doesn't um, follow one specific character, you still, it feels kind of like you drop into someone's life and you just are immersed in it just for a few moments and then um, move on. But that kind of feeling of immersion in this observational way is something that I wanted to emulate and so it was I was wondering like can I make a film that does both at once that has like the macro and the micro and um, is able to capture something of systems but also capture individuality and sort of these unpredictable human moments and a lot of it is that um, going into spaces we mic people as much as possible mm -hmm. um, we didn't have a sound recordist um, like Nate and I were the sound people but we didn't have someone with like a boom pole recording audio. Um, we just had lob mics that we would put on people whenever possible. Um, and I, I think it's a combination of Jess's style of how we shot the film and she also edited the film and in, in editing, like finding those senses of humanity in people, I think it really comes through. I think like I always talk about the first 10 minutes of the movie where it feels a little robotic and monotonous and watching it you're like oh I've seen this before but then there's a moment where you go to the water bottle factory mm -hmm. and the woman looks directly into the camera but she's looking directly at you as an audience member and I think you can really see the humanity in this person and and you get a sense like she's just she's taking a break for like a split second there um and I think that there's like a moment where the, the movie switches and I think it's a big testament to Jess's editing. I think that's right. I mean, the movie sort of just something opens up for me in that moment and my way of looking at my, my, my encounter with the film changes. Um, in terms of that moment, if you don't sort of like mind burrowing into it, uh, is, the, is there, I'm, I'm curious if there was a, even a sense of, of timing that happened there like you said there's there's something sort of robotic and that moment happens is it just the look is there also is that is, is that cut come later than the previous cuts i'm just kind of curious how that kind of it just works physically even watching it i think that it's probably it's a longer take than some of the other ones are afforded probably something with the music too i haven't yeah. watched that section in a while but i think rhythmically there was maybe a shift involved in it well, she like she pauses also. She's like, like I said, she she takes a, a brief moment and looks, yeah, she's not looks back at you instead of uh, yeah. you looking at her. Yeah, because um, for the most part before that, people are moving in the frame. They're, yeah. they're working. But I think this is she's sort of taking a break and she's holding what I like about it, too. She's holding the plastic water bottle to her face kind of pensively too, yeah. like yeah. using it in a way where it's not really meant to be used, um, which I like. And then also later in that same um, sequence at that plastic water bottle factory, you have that uh, young woman who's sorting them on the conveyor belt. And then she takes a break too. And she takes a sip out of her thermos that she's brought to work with her. And her, we had mic'd actually. And you can, because of that, you can hear her unscrewing the metal mm -hmm. lid and screwing it back on. And I remember people were asking me, like our fixer at the time, Jack was like, why do you want to mic this person? She's not talking. And I, I was like, it doesn't matter. There's, there's just something about the first person sound that we wanted to capture to get that perspective. And I'm glad that I did so that I could, cause it's not something I necessarily would have thought to like sound design in, you know, or it, it's, it might've even been a scene that I kind of overlooked too, if I hadn't heard that while I was going through the footage too. So just little things like that. And I think because we weren't going in to um, prove a certain thesis that I had in mind about this film, 
it allowed us to be very generous with the types of material we were capturing. Mm -hmm. And um, in some ways we were very intentional about the types of places we were going to, but once we were there, you know, we had a lot of PDR mics, which are logs that record onto themselves. We just put them on whoever would let us, would, you know, was comfortable with it and would let the audio run without monitoring it or trying to um, strategize, like looking for a specific conversation. It was really like an open-ended kind of discovery process. Mm -hmm. um, uh, you mentioned, we, you know, we, we chatted briefly before we hit record um, uh, and about Frederick Wiseman. And, and obviously um, your film is quite different from a lot of the ways that Fred Wiseman films are made, but it's really interesting to think about the ways in which um, there is a crossover. I mean, Frederick Wiseman is also somebody who um, does his own sound and, on films and directs with sound a lot of the time. Um, and obviously you're shooting things differently. He also is somebody who, though you may not know this uh, based on sort of the, the level of detail, right, he's not somebody who does uh, character portraits um, and he is sort of, um, and you may not see a person again for, you may see them in one scene and never again. Um, and, and yet you, something significantly and, and deep and human sort of comes from those moments and you're doing that, but you're doing that in even more collapsed sense of time, right? Fred Wiseman's not somebody who spends years with subjects, but he'll spend a, a couple weeks maybe. You're often spending a couple hours at a time in there. So what it winds up being though, I think it's puts that much more pressure on um, your way of looking. And I think it sort of says a lot about your way of looking and actually what it is you're looking for, what it is that you're seeing, what you're observing. And so then what becomes something that you actually can make uh, that humanizes even in a short span of time. So I'd love to hear, my long way of saying, I'd love to hear about um, uh, your, your design for looking exactly how you shoot, what you're looking for in terms of what you might you might want later on. Um, a rule that we set up for ourselves early on was for the most part, everything was on sticks and um, it was static shots. So there's little to no camera movements. Um, and in that way, we kind of allow scenes to play out in themselves and I find while editing and looking at footage, um, oftentimes I'm really surprised by what the footage tells me because in the moment I might not have recognized it, which is just a testament to the, the camera's ability to record in an unbiased kind of way. Of course, there's always bias in terms of how you set up the frame and such, but um, you know, just in terms of this kind of faithful time-based replication of how a moment is playing out, um, a lot of it had to do with in the, sh in the moment of shooting, the faith that the camera might be picking something up that I'm not seeing in the moment. Mm -hmm. So for me, a sense of discipline, I had to cultivate this sense of discipline, um, which I've been trying to do throughout my shooting career of not touching the camera. And oftentimes in, sh in the editing room, I would always get mad at myself when I saw that I would move the camera because then one, the second the camera's moved, the shot's over mm -hmm. or a new shot has to begin. And Nate, who also shot this with me, um, is really incredible at picking up a director's vision and being able to mimic that and not just mimic, but really bring his own vision to it, but uh, kind of understanding the world through the director's eyes. And so, you know, he does that with John Wilson on, on how to, and he did this with this. And I felt like you had a lot of discipline with like taking long shots that, cause sometimes I'd get overwhelmed and impatient. There's so much going on and I'd always want to just like, shoot as many things as possible, but it's really about committing to that, to that one shot. Well, and it's also being open to whatever the setting would provide to yeah. us. Like for like going to the, the bodyguard school, you know, we didn't, we expected just like a bodyguard school, but it turns out it's in like in a ghost town full of Italian villas and like, you know, that like beauty and the beast looking building in the background, yeah. that was our hotel. Um, and <laughs> And we were like the only ones there, of course. Yeah, and it was like abandoned. And it, I don't know, we recorded a bunch of sound in there. And like, we didn't expect the guy to just have his goats that he loved. And we like followed the goats around for a while. And it, it was just kind of like developing those ideas just based on what was literally happening right in front of us. And at times it would be like, I thought you wanted to shoot the, the, the bodyguards. And we we're like, yeah, but the goats are right here. This is interesting. <laughs> We used, a, we used a few drone shots as well, um, but we tried to make them not look like drone shots, except the one at the very end, you can tell that's a drone shot. Um, but we tried to make them not look that way by um, 
having a stationary drone, mm -hmm. which I realize is actually physically harder than having a moving drone, which makes sure. sense. It's like physics, it's harder to stay still in one place. Yeah, but the drone, works. huh? The wind is yeah, blowing. The, yeah, the drone yeah. ops were always trying to like move it in these sort of sweeping kind of classical shots. And I'd always be like, no, 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 don't move it at all. And I was always getting so much pushback from them. And then I realized, oh, obviously it's because it's, it's much harder to keep it right. still. Right. Is there any way to do that in post where you kind of stabilize it? Well, we, have to, we could stabilize some, but yeah. yeah. Did you, in, in terms of location, I mean, I think you're answering the question already in terms of like in that particular location where you're following the goats around and all that, but I'm curious whether or not, do you design a certain amount of shots in that space? Like you go in that day thinking like, these are the things, these are the setups we know that we want, or is it more kind of organic? And are you, do, are you shooting separately or are you kind of um, taking turns by what the main shot is? Well, because we don't have scouting trips where we go in and see what's happening, we just go in and start shooting. We can't, we don't really have time to like design certain shots that we want. And also in China, so much of what's happening is really unpredictable. And, you know, it's supposed to be one thing and then it ends up to being something completely different than what you expected. So a lot of it was really adapting to the moment and um, kind of adjusting on the fly. So it was hard to um even to the point that like Jess had asked one of our fixers to find a plastic bottle recycling factory. And the one there are a bunch of different shots from the the massive one that we shot in that's like the size of a small city. Um, but they were recycling plastic bottles into carpets. So it's also that textile factory that we were shooting in with like all the the screen printing and all the like uh the rugs like going into the heaters and things that was like the request for the plastic bottle recycling factory was that place okay yeah, we had no idea it was going to be carpets wow. but um for the most part we shot with one camera with an fs7 and nate and i would just kind of pass the camera off and on like uh -huh. i'd be tuning and then we'd be like i see something can i can i grab that for a sec and then i give it to yeah. him and then give it back to me and okay. just, yeah that's, that's, that, that seems like a really unique approach. Like, I don't think I've ever heard that in terms of passing the camera between. Yeah. It's very democratic. Yeah. I mean, also sometimes I would feel like I had exhausted all the all the possibilities of one place of shooting everything. And I'd be like, I'm done, let's go. And it would be like, no, no, no. Like, I got something, hold on, let me, you know? So it was sort of once one person exhausted themselves out then the other person would kind of take over. Okay, okay. Um, I'd love to talk a little bit, but we haven't talked about the structure and how, um, uh, you know, there's, there's a sense of, of a three act or a three part structure here, sort of making our way through the supply chain, but not in, not in a sort of declarative sense, not, you're not underscoring it, but it is happening. And I'd love to know a little bit about how that evolved as a shape. And is that something that kind of came together over time? Or is that something that was an, was an early idea? The concept of ascension for the structure of the film really came towards the end, which is funny because it seems so obvious, but you know, I realized that sometimes the most obvious things are, you need a kind of convoluted path to get there. Mm -hmm. um, so I would edit scenes in chunks and because there was no explicit narrative structure, the scenes I treated as modular, um, pieces that I could move around and I would try to have them echo each other but as I kept going um, the the concept of going up the class ladder sort of solidified and then after I had that overall structure I was able to play with it more and lean into the psychedelic or surreal elements of it and kind of put shots in where you wouldn't expect them to fit in but um I think after we had like a solid kind of um, intellectual structure, I could try to undo it a little bit. You know, it seemed this like it, it, it's for something with such a, a a wonderful and productive and provocative structure. It doesn't play as a structuralist movie, and I feel like if you had that idea set from the beginning, you may have shot to fit into those buckets in a way that maybe wouldn't have made it as effective as it is. Yeah, I. I I think having Nate and Kira as my producers gave me a lot of like creative um, leeway and permission almost to really experiment. Um, so, you know, having people on my team who were very in 
encouraging of like taking out that drawing out that playful element was was super helpful and sure. actually at one point I did have um chapter headings within the film it was going to be structured and maybe in like three to five chapter headings but Nate kind of fought hard to take those out mm. and I realized he was right later on um I had been thinking and, and I came to think of them as training wheels mm. or scaffolding to um build a structure off of and then once I took those chapter headings out I could let the the piece the chapters sort of bleed into each other in this kind of stream of consciousness way yeah I think the structure too is like uh it, it starts out very like rigid and, and and like loosens up and gets more psychedelic as the movie goes on and it's like well if you were open to that idea then you'll be definitely open to this idea and it, <laughs> and it, 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 it just kind of like unravels itself in a way yeah. Um, trick people into it yeah. into the crazy vision or make, make people yeah. comfortable with it yeah. oh and then I forgot um after this is something I like don't I forget to talk about in the editing but um after that um scene of people going down the water slides um that's when it gets really it really goes off the rails and but that comes right after the section of people taking naps of like mm -hmm. sleeping and in my mind, I was thinking, oh, like the movie's about the Chinese dream and all these people are sleeping. What are they dreaming about? Mm -hmm. And then maybe everything that comes after is a kind of dream since it becomes more psychedelic. That's just at least the story I that, that I tell myself to give myself some permission to go. Some permission. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, cause it, right, because I mean, it's it's psychedelic, but there's also something kind of tonal and even kind of, you know, sort of gently moral about that, too. And the idea of, you know, if, if we're going to make our way to that ascended place and this is what we're actually seeing and this is how people are actually going to spend their leisure time, it it, 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 it almost sort of demands a, a bit more play there. It demands a sort of hint of irony. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and and it's a sort of thing where I'm grateful for everything that leads up to it. And you're kind of, you kind of want to spend more time in these awful spaces with some of these awful people, but it's also probably best that we don't spend more time. <laughs> and then of course you double back at the very end too, which I think is extraordinary, you know, um, when you, you sort of have these spaces really kind of overlapping, um, which um, is, I, you know, I, one of my favorite endings of the film in recent memory is, is sort of, is having that exist in the frame. You mean the like scene of people in the river who are swimming or the the um the 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 grass area. Oh the um photographer at the fancy oh, yeah. hotel. Yeah. Yeah. I just feel like I feel like the sort of like the the layers of class system sort of coming in towards, yeah. towards oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Converging altogether. Converging right. in that feel. Like it's a sort of thing where, you know, if you were worried about us following along, um, you would sort of maybe seed that a lot of times along the way, but I don't feel like you need to do that. It sort of feels really, really powerful to have that kind of collapsing in on itself a bit. Towards yeah, it. early on that that scene actually was in the middle. Yeah. And then was it your idea to put it at the end? Someone's idea, it wasn't my idea to put it at the end. I didn't like it for the longest time. And only when huh. it was at the end was I like, oh, this actually works. Yeah. Yeah, it took a really long time to get that at the end. But then it, once it was there, I was like, oh, this is just everything. This is just, it is yeah. like. Before that, it. it was too on the nose or something. Yeah. Right. But having it later, something about it, like it helped it redeem itself. Well, and, and it inverts our focus, right? Like we, when somebody's like watching it, we rack focus within the shot to sort of notice yeah. something else. Yeah. Mm -hmm. anyway. I'm going to leave it there. Um, so folks can sort of have more to take out with them. Um, and uh, I also think we haven't spoiled it if folks were eager, eager to watch this with it before seeing the film. Um, but thank you both. I love this film. I love you guys. And it's really great to be able to talk to you about the film. And it's, good luck over the next couple I love weeks. Converging. Conversing? Oh, gosh. <laughs> I messed it up. I messed the whole thing. Always up. a pleasure. Good to see you, Eric. <laughs> good to see you both. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.